Muhammad, peace be Pearls of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Abdullah bin Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Truthfulness leads to albir, that is, piety, righteousness, and every act of obedience to Allah, and albir leads to paradise. And a man keeps on telling the truth until he becomes a Siddiq, that is, a truthful person. Falsehood leads to al fujur that is, wickedness, evil doing, etc. And al fujur leads to the hell fire. And a man keeps on telling lies till he is written as a liar before Allah. Agreed upon. Sahih al-Bukhari, Volume 8, Kitabul Adab, Book of Manners, Chapter 69, Hadith Number 6094, Sahih Muslim, Volume 4, Kitabul Bir, Vassila Wal Adab, Book of Virtues, Good Manners, and Joining of the Time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Welcome to the series Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakia. I'm your host, Yusuf Chambers, and today we will discuss the topic acts permitted during the fast. Dr. Zakir, question relates to a woman who's cooking during the fast. Is she allowed to taste the food? As long as the person who's cooking the food, whether it be a gent cook or lady cook, there's a hadith in Sayyid Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, chapter number 25. It says Ibn Abbas, he narrated that tasting food from the pots or meals, it does not break the fast. This is a Mullah hadith of Bukhari, but it is connected along with Sayyid Ibn Shaiba and Bahaki, and the chain goes on. It makes it Sahih. And it says that Ibn Abbas, may Allah please with him, he says that tasting vinegar and food while fasting. So all these hadith prove that while fasting a person can taste food, but you have to be careful. The food should not enter your throat, you should not swallow the food. And that is the reason the scholars say that if it is required you should do it, otherwise not. For example, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, he says that tasting food is makru, unless it is a necessity. Same with Sheikh ibn Taymiyyah, he says that it is makru unless it is a necessity. And why it's a necessity if a woman is cooking food? She has to place the food on the tip of the tongue. So that she realizes whether the food is sweet or salty. And then she should spit it out. She should not swallow it. So that will not break her fast. Or if a mother wants to give food to the baby, and the only way she can give is by chewing it. So she is permitted to chew the food and then give it to the baby. But care should be taken that they should not follow any particle of the food. She should spit it out. So these are necessities where it's permissible to taste food, but unnecessary. Just because you're feeling hungry and you taste it, it's makhru. Though it will not break the fast, makhru means discouraged. It will not break the fast. But otherwise, for a necessity, 
It can be done, but care should be taken. It does not go down the throat. It should not be followed. After tasting, the food should be spat out. Okay, I'm glad that you uh, corrected me in a way and said uh, we're not gender specific because, of course, we know that men do cook and they should be encouraged to do so as well. Dr. Zakir, relating to the application of al-kuhl or black eyeliner, as we know, it is sunnah. It is a sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. May Allah bless him. Um, is it something which is permitted during the fast? As far as putting alcohol in our country, India it's called a surma or a black eyeliner, it's sunnah of the Prophet. And we get in the hadith that Anas Mallah will please with him. He used to always stay with the Prophet, he used to cook his food also, and he used to put this alcohol. And the Prophet never prohibited him, even when he put during fasting. So this proves that. Putting kohal does not break the fast, it is permitted. And even when you put any eye drops or ear drops, even if the ear drops or eye drops, after a certain time, you can feel the taste in the throat. According to most of the scholars, it does not invalidate the fast. Because that is not the normal passage of food. And eye drops, these are medicine, they aren't food. And there are times. That because you know that having a medical doctor, the ears, nose, and throat they're connected, known as ENT. ENT, ear, nose, throat. So when you put eye drops, even the ear drops, you know, nasal drops, there are chances after some time it may go into the throat and you may feel the taste. If it's a nasal drop, you should throw it out. But ear drops and eye drops, you feel the taste. According to most of the scholars, it does not break the fast. But there are some scholars who say that if it reaches the throat, it will nullify the fast. But the right ruling is that because it's not the normal passage for food and drink, according to most of the scholars, it does not nullify the fast. And if someone who's has a doubt, the best for him is he delays putting those nasal drops after the sunset, so he's absolutely safe. But the right ruling is that even if you put a nasal drop or ear drop, it does not break the fast. Does the same apply for atar or perfume? You mean wearing perfume? Yes, wearing perfume. For instance, if you're going to apply perfume before or during the fast, is the ruling the same? If you wear a perfume and if you smell it, there's no problem at all. Smelling perfume is permitted. Any sort of perfume, as long as it is not an incense smoke. You know, you get smoke sticks or smoke that come. Smelling that excessively, it may go in the nose, it may go in the stomach, and particles may go. So that is a bukhur. 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 Ah. So that is what you should be careful of, you know. Where otherwise, smelling perfume, it's permitted, it will not break the fast. The next question is regarding injections. Is it permitted during the fast? As far as injections are concerned, there are different types of injections. It can be intravenous injection, it can be intramuscular injection, it can be subcutaneous injection. But the injections can broadly be classified in two types. One type of injection which gives a person a nourishment, which is equivalent to giving food. For example, if you take an intravenous glucose, the people who have excessive dehydration, etc., and cannot take food by the mouth, so normally the medical treatment is giving intravenous glucose. This is sort of nourishment. It is equivalent to giving food, this will break the fast. But if it's not a nourishment, if it's only a medical treatment like insulin, it can be subcutaneously or it is penicillin. All these medical treatments which are not nourishment to the body, are not somewhat like food, these can be given during the daytime and the fast will not break. Though there are some scholars who say that it's makru or discouraged, it's preferable if it's taken after the sunset, but the right ruling is that it does not break the fast because it's not any sort of food. Okay. In terms of uh, medical treatments, um, whilst one is fasting, such as nasal drops, sublingual tablets to be used under the tongue, um, or medical investigations where things are inserted into uh, your body. Are these things permitted during the fast? There are a variety of treatments and investigations. The list is long. We can have a full episode on this. Time will not permit us to discuss all this. 
I'll just mention a few which come to my mind. As far as sublingual tablets are concerned, they are normally taken for angina. Person has a heart problem, he takes it. This sublingual tablet is kept beneath the tongue. It is not supposed to be swallowed. And it is not a sort of food or nourishment. It gets absorbed and the treatment is done. So because of this ruling, it does not break the fast. You should not swallow the tablet. It goes subcutaneously, it gets absorbed without going to the throat. If you use nasal drops, as long as the nasal drop does not go to the throat and to the stomach, it's permitted. If you put ear drops, also it's permitted as I mentioned earlier. Or if you syringe the ear, even that's permitted. As far as investigations are concerned, if you do a per vaginal investigation, whether you insert a finger or you insert an instrument, it's permitted. Or for treatment, if you insert a vaginal pessary or you insert a douch or any instruments, it's permitted. If you insert an instrument in the uterus or any device known as IUD, intrauterine device, or you insert a catheter for investigation or a scope, all these are permitted. Even if you insert in the urinary tract, that is the urethra, a catheter or inject a dye for doing an investigation, it does not break the fast. Similarly, if you take any injection, as I mentioned earlier, subcutaneous or intravenous, or intramuscular, as long as it is not a nourishment for the body, it's no nutrient for the body, it doesn't substitute the food, it's permitted. If it's a substitute, it breaks the fast. Furthermore, if you take a little bit of blood from the body for testing, that doesn't break the fast also. And if you apply certain creams, maybe cream or lotion or medical ointment on the skin and it gets absorbed by the skin, this too does not break the fast and it is perfectly permitted and if you take other treatments like for example if you do a laparoscopy in which there is a small insertion made on the abdomen and insert a scope whether for investigation or whether for treatment or for a surgery it's permitted if you do a gastroscopy insert a scope into the stomach as long as you do not put in some fluids or some nourishment it's permitted for investigation. If you put an instrument in the spinal cord to examine the spinal cord or to see how the brain is functioning, all these are permitted. If you do enema, even that's permitted. And you can go on and on as long as the basic rule is that it should not enter the body through the mouth or through the nose or it should not be a nourishment. Otherwise, if it enters any other part of the body, any instrument, whether it be the urethra, whether it be the uterus, whether it be the vagina, all these things. And the basic rule, it does not break the fast because it is not giving food to the body and this is not the normal passage for food for the body. All these are permitted. I think the fact that the other things are permitted will uh, put uh, a lot of people's minds at rest yes, during this coming Ramadan and Ramadans inshallah. to come, inshallah. inshallah. Dear brothers and sisters, we'll be back after a short break. It is not ask me on the day of judgment is Osama bin Laden a terrorist or not. That is not my basis to pass the examination that do you agree Saddam Hussein is a terrorist or not. Anything which contradicts the way of Rasulullah is wrong. Anything which contradicts the Quran of any of the other scriptures is wrong. The Quran is 100% the word of Allah. Dr. Abu Amina Bilal Phillips. Everything else was martyr, it's clear, it is false, and we call to that truth. This is the truth. Muslim. 
living in any part of the world. He is our brother. We should feel for him. Muslims are suffering. Muslims are butchered. Muslims are slain. And some of us even they don't feel, they don't cry over that. Salim well, Al-Amri. If one organ is in pain, the whole body feels that. Whether he's in India, whether he's in Far East, whether he's wherever the Muslim is, he is my brother. I should feel for him. Welcome to the show Ramadan A Date with Dr. Zakia. I'm your host, Yusuf Chambers, and today we are discussing acts that are permitted during the fast. Dr. Zakia, what is the ruling regarding issues of doubt when one has doubts over concerns that they have over things that they may be doing during the fast? What should one do? How can we apply a golden set of rules to the doubt? As far as when a person has a doubt, the doubt he's doing, is it permissible or not? Or if he has a doubt that it will break the fast, the best is, when in doubt, leave it out. When a doubt comes, the best is to abstain from it, lest it may have been prohibited. If you have a doubt and if you don't do it, then it will not be a sin. So it's preferable to stay away from it. But the best golden rule is, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 43, as well as Surah Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number 7. First, Allah, Ahal Zikri in Kuntum La Talamu. If you don't know, ask the person who has the message. Ask the person who is knowledgeable. Go and ask a scholar, and he will guide you whether it's permissible or not. That's the best. But till that time, when in doubt, leave it out is the best policy. Good advice. If a person, in the situation where one feels compulsed or forced into breaking the fast, or when one breaks it out of ignorance of a ruling, is it permissible that this person should be breaking their fast in such conditions? As a rule, whether the fast breaks or not, or is it permissible? If someone is forced to break it out of ignorance, out of mistake, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nahl, chapter number 16, verse number 106, that after you have believed, and then if you go to unbelief, unless it is out of compulsion, that means even if you do shirk out of compulsion, as long as in your heart there is taqwa, fear of Allah, then it's permissible. So if someone forces you something which is not allowed and it breaks the fast, then you're not responsible for that. As far as the general ruling is concerned, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, it's mentioned in Ibn Majah, volume number 3, hadith number 2043, as well as 2045. He said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has excused my ummah from mistakes, from forgetfulness, and from that which is forced on them. So besides force, even if it's a mistake, or if it is due to forgetfulness, Allah excuses that. And that's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Ahzab, chapter number 33, verse number 5 that if you do it out of mistake and don't intend doing it, then Allah will forgive you. And Allah also mentioned in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse number 286, where we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Our Lord, please do not hold us responsible for our mistakes and forgetfulness. So basically, the things that break the fast, whether it be eating, drinking, intercourse, etc., all this, there are four criteria to be looked into. If it's done by force, under compulsion, then you're not responsible. If someone forces something on you, you aren't responsible. Allah will hold you responsible. Number two, if it is done out of mistake, for example, a person, he has suhur, and he thinks yet dawn hasn't come, and he continues eating. It's a mistake. The moment he realizes, he stops eating. So that's a mistake which Allah will forgive. Or, someone does something out of forgetfulness, like a person eats or drinks water while fasting unintentionally, out of forgetfulness, then Allah forgives you and the fast is valid. 
And the fourth thing is that if he does out of ignorance, because he was not aware of it. For example, if a person doesn't know that vomiting deliberately, vomiting intentionally breaks the fast, and because he has uneasiness and he puts a finger in his throat and vomits out, then it is out of ignorance of the ruling. Even that Allah will forgive, inshallah. So these four categories, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want to overburden us, and a Prophet said that if these are the case out of ignorance, out of mistake, out of forgetfulness, if someone has a compulsion, all these things, inshallah, Allah will forgive you. And that's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indeed, Dr. Zakir, it's clear to me, and I'm sure it's clear to the viewers, that Allah's mercy overcomes his wrath. Allahu Akbar. Subhanallah. Well, we've come to the end of the interview stage. Now, I'd like to um, turn to our viewers' questions Inshallah. on the topic. Inshallah. So, without further ado, I have a question for one of the viewers. If a person is suffering from asthma, um, can he or she utilize using treatments like oxygen vaporizers and other oral tablets? As far as a person who's taking treatment for asthma, there are different types of treatment taken for persons suffering from asthma. It can be puffers, it can be oxygen, it can be vaporizers, it can be tablets and capsules. In short, when a person uses a puffer, the gas goes by force into the lungs, expands the lung. And in no way does it break the fast because it's mere gas going to the lungs. It's not a food. It doesn't go into the stomach. And it's only gas, so it does not break the fast if a person uses a puffer. As far as oxygen is concerned, that too, it's inhaled, goes in the lungs, comes out. So oxygen per se also does not break the fast, does not invalidate the fast. But as far as vaporizers are concerned, vaporizers can be of different types, can be in form of liquid, can be gaseous, in form of particles. And this medicine is put in a container and once the button is pressed, the pressure which comes and by pressure it enters into the lungs and it may be through a nozzle, can be through a mask, but when it enters the lungs, there are high chances that there are particles which may even go into the stomach. So that's the reason most of the scholars say that vaporizers as a treatment for asthma, it will break the fast. As far as capsules are concerned, the capsules, they contain the medicine in the form of a powder. It has a covering. Once you put in the container and when the pressure is released, it comes out by force. But this too can enter the stomach, the particles. So even using these capsules as a treatment of asthma, it will surely break the fast. So only two things which are permitted as far as the person suffering from the disease of asthma is puffers and oxygen. This will not break the fast. Another question from one of our viewers. Is it permissible to use toothpaste whilst fasting? As far as using toothpaste is concerned, most of the scholars say that using toothpaste is permissible, including Sheikh bin Baz. May Allah have mercy on him. He says that using toothpaste along with toothbrush is like using sewak. And the Prophet has never prohibited using sewak. It's perfectly all right. It doesn't break the fast. But it will be careful that you should not swallow any of it. The so swallowing any part of the toothpaste is forbidden. That there is in some scholars say it's makhru thinking, oh, if someone has toothpaste, it has a strong taste and someone will swallow. So that is the reason some say it's discouraged. But the right ruling is that as long as you're careful that you don't swallow any part of it, you can use a toothpaste and a toothbrush, it does not nullify your fast. Okay, excellent. Next question from the viewers. Should a person spit having rinsed or washed his mouth out generally or after making wudu? Normally when people fast, there are some people who think that after you gargle your mouth with water or rinse your mouth with water, then they should spit out because, you know, maybe some water will be swallowed. But the general ruling is that most of the scholars agree that once you gargle the mouth, and after expulsion of the water from the mouth, there's no need to spit. It's not a requirement. And even those few scholars who say you should spit, it's only once. But there are some people who spit several times. Some people even take a cloth and they dry their mouth. 
you know, after gargling, thinking that the water will, you know, go into the stomach, which is absurd. Because normally when we see and we read the seed of the Prophet and the lifestyle of the Sahabas, many a times when they drank water just before Fajr, before beginning the fast, when they heard the Fajr Azan, they stopped drinking. But we have never heard of any Sahaba spitting out after drinking water. If you have to spit while gargling, the people when they have water just before starting the fast at the end of the sore, when they heard the Azan, surely some Hadith would have said that the Sahaba, they spat. You know, so that the water doesn't go into, which is not seen. And while doing wudu, when you gargle the mouth, go into the mouth, and you expel the water, that's it. Even if you have to spit maximum, I think once is sufficient. You can't go beyond that spitting several times and, you know, taking a cloth and drying your mouth. Everything else that remains can be counted as part of the saliva. There's no problem at all. You can't make life difficult for you. It's good to know that, actually. We make life very difficult when one was fasting, if we had to do that. Thank you very much, Dr. Zakir. Indeed, Dr. Zakir Naik, we have reached the end of the show, and I must say that I am surprised that the number of acts which are permitted... You know, it's often the case that you feel, when you're mixing with the brothers and sisters, Islam is all about no, no, no. It's actually about yes, yes, yes. Alhamdulillah. I'm so Only glad. a few no's no's. A few no no's. <laughs> but alhamdulillah, it's been enlightening and very enjoyable as well, I must say. Brothers and sisters, I'm sure that you will agree with me. And I request you, once again, to encourage your friends, even if they are brothers and sisters in humanity as opposed to in Islam, to join us tomorrow at the same time when we will be discussing acts recommended and discouraged whilst fasting. So do join us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. حافظين ذاكرين قانتين خاشعين مسلمين مؤمنين للإله عابدين شهونا صب وعتق وقنوت فيه صدق يهونا صبر ورق بدمع البائسين رمضان قد أهلت بالصيام وأقل مصعدا أهلا وخلا لته في كل A friendly message by Dr. Zakir, mother of all evils. According to the World Health Organization, every year, millions of people die due to the consumption of alcohol. My colleagues, the medical doctors, nowadays say that alcoholism is a disease. Therefore, we have to be sympathetic towards a sick alcoholic person. If alcoholism is indeed a disease, then it is the only disease that is sold in bottles. It is the only disease that is advertised in the newspapers, in the magazines, on radio broadcast stations, on television satellite channels. It is the only disease that has outlets licensed to legally spread it. It gets a revenue for the government. It is the only disease that causes violent deaths on the highways. It destroys family life and increases crime. It is the only disease that has no germs or viral cause. But our Creator, the Almighty says, in His last testament, the glorious Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amun, O you who believe, Innamal khamru wal maithuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, wal ansabu wal azlam, dedication of stones, divination by arrows, rich summin amali shaitan. These are an abomination of Satan's handiwork. Fashta nibuhu, lallakum tuflihun. Abstain from such abomination that you may prosper. Alcoholism is not a disease, it is Satan's handiwork. Abstain from it that you may prosper. Peace TV, the solution for humanity.